you build your life on your faith. title of the message today while you're getting your Bibles ready. And of course, if you don't have a Bible, don't feel bad or you don't have one with you. Uh, there'll be scriptures on the screen here that you can follow. And, and uh, so I want to share with you today a message called God Delights in Me. God Delights in Me. I want to settle some very clear things today because there are so many voices Voices of our mistakes, voices of our past, voices of our experiences, and unfortunately, the voices sometimes of other people who are telling us a different story than what God is saying about us. And we may draw a conclusion at the end or listening to those voices that God really isn't that happy with me. And for sure, he isn't delighted with me or really wants to be with me or likes me. You know, it's one thing to be with people who tolerate you. It's another thing to be with people who really like you. Uh, you help your neighbor out and tell them, hey, I really like you. <laughs> yeah, I really like you. <laughs> Have you ever been with someone and you, and you left? Maybe you're, you're with your family as you're leaving a place or, or you know, you've met someone and, and you kind of make some conversation. Next thing you know, you say something like, uh, man, I really like those people. I really like those people or I like that person or, you know, that's a whole different level than that's a whole different feeling than, well, I was with those people, can't, sure can't wait to get away from them. <laughs> have you ever been with some, don't lift your hand, have you ever, <laughs> have you, and don't say that to your neighbor. <laughs> And so, and so uh, you know, it's a whole different feeling to leave somewhere and go, I like those people or I like that person than to have been somewhere for a couple hours or for a period of time. And go, man, I can't wait to get away. You know, I, it was great to be there, but man, is it nice not to. And I, I say that because we can relate to that. And you'd be surprised how many Christians literally live their lives that kind of way. You know, I'm going to visit God at church, but I'm not sure that he really wants to see me or that he's delighted with me, that he would want to really be with me on Monday morning when I go to work, that he really wants to be with me and likes me. I want to tell you right up front, God is not just tolerating you. God is not just cleaning you up so that he can put up with you. God delights in you. God loves me. He loves being with me. He wants me to be with him and wants to be with me more than I want to be with him. Oh, hallelujah. I just like saying it. God likes me. God delights in me. He didn't make us because he wanted to tolerate us. He made us because we were the objects of his love. We were the objects of his passion. We were the objects of his delight. And he made us in such a way that after we were created, he looked at us and went, Ooh, that is very good. <laughs> yes, when he made me, he went, I like that guy. He is very good. I, I got a whole message here to preach, but I could get excited, I already am, about God liking me. Huh? 
He likes me. He doesn't just tolerate me, loves me, likes me. And, and see, there's already people struggling with this in this audience right here. People are already struggling with it in a religious kind of way. But I just, let's jump right to the end here and then I'll sandwich the rest between the bookends. How about it? Let's just run right to the end and go, see, here's why you can rejoice through this whole service, through this whole sermon with everything screaming at you or religious thoughts coming at you going, I don't know if what he's saying is true because I know myself. I know how many mistakes I've made. I know what I'm like. I even know my thoughts. But that's why we preach this beautiful gospel, which is called the good news, is because the more aware uh, that you are of your shortcoming, the more you realize that he delights in you because he made you and accepted you in Christ Jesus. That's the beauty of this thing. Doesn't matter what the voices, what our mistakes, where we have been, what they're saying to us, God is saying something different. He sees us through his intention and through his love and his delight. And he goes, that Stephen Schlebach, I like him. I can't wait until he wakes up tomorrow morning so I can be talking with him and walking with him and telling him things. Matter of fact, I just, I, his mercies are new. God's mercies, he says, my mercies are new toward him every day. I delight in him. Every day I see him covered by the blood of Jesus. His mer my mercies are on him. My grace is on him. He lives in my favor. He is just in the favor with me, just like like Jesus, my son, I delight in him. You got to get this deep, deep, deep in your heart and get the revelation from scripture because everything around you, including the religious world, will try to tell you something different. Will try to tell you that he doesn't delight in you. And here's the most subtle of them he'll like you if you change. If you can just get things right, he'll like you. Let, okay, let's, okay, let's leave that over here for a second, come over to just some real practical stuff. Let me help you with your marriages and human relationships. Only relationship worth having is unconditional ones. If you're going to wait till those people are perfect, you're going you're to beat your head against the wall for a long, long time. If you're going to withhold your love and your acceptance and your relationship with people until they measure up for you, you're going to live a lonely life with a lot of walls up. Imagine if God withdrew his delight every time you just violate a little bit of his perfection. You wouldn't even be in his favor right now because I'm sure you had some thought that just wasn't pure love this morning. <laughs> right? I mean, did anybody have any negative thought about someone today? I mean, if it was even close, somebody drove too slow. I mean, I, I thought some things in myself as I was driving out the road because as we're driving, I'm going 60 miles an hour. and Here come three cars by me doing about 90 on Fruitville Road here, you know. And I'm thinking, and I just, I named them a few things. And, uh, and uh, it wasn't too bad, but it wasn't God's perfect love. <laughs> and, 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 so, and so if I, that were the measure of my acceptance, I'd be in trouble. But it's not. The measure of my love and his delight is found in his intention for me and the fix for that intention on the cross of Calvary. 
<laughs> Glory be to God. Come on, let's get used to it. You need to be saying this the rest of your life because by the end of today, you're going to put all your faith and trust in him anyway. So you might as well start it right now and say, he delights in me. He delights. Come on, put your hands on your heart. He delights in me. Hey, let's make it even simpler. He likes me. He likes me. Shoo. Glory, hallelujah. He, he likes me. This is not just anybody. This isn't the banker I met. This isn't the new person I met at the mall. This isn't, this is God, the creator of heaven and earth. And he likes me. He likes me with all my faults. He likes me the way I am. He likes me because he made me according to his good pleasure. Come on, let's go through the scriptures. Let me, let me get you in the word here. We got lots of them to go through. Uh, Matthew chapter 8 and verse 1 through 3. You can see them here on the screen if you want or follow in your Bible. When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Look at that phrase right there. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And then the next verse says, Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Now, this is a story of healing here, but the part I want to pull out of there is just this question, Lord, if you are willing, you can heal me. And from that phrase, I just want to take this part, Lord, if you are willing, you can heal me. Most people don't question the ability of God and his promises and what he has done for us in the redemptive work of Christ. But a lot of people don't realize this was his delight. This was his joy. This is what he wanted to do. And when he said to that leper, I am willing, he, sa he is saying in that word, I want to and I delight to. It is my pleasure to do it. I want to use it in a much more general way than that, just to put the foundation out for this message that God not just can forgive our sins. God hasn't just made us the righteousness of God. It's not just what he has done in his ability, but it is what he has done in his delight. He wanted to do this. This is his good pleasure. What he has done for you and I is what he wanted to do. He isn't just putting up with me. He likes me. <laughs> Come on, say it with me. He likes me. Shoo. Yeah, he likes me. It's his good pleasure. In Matthew, uh, in Matthew, Jesus said, it's my good pleasure to give you the kingdom or to the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, I think it says. Uh, let's see, where is that? Luke Luke 32, I think it is, or Luke 12, 32. Um, yeah, there it is. It's my Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. This is going to take a little work today, but if you can hear with your heart, you'll find the resounding truth of God's Word bearing witness with your heart in the pleasure of God towards you. God likes you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Isn't that awesome? 
Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, you want to highlight these scriptures, write them down, study them, make them a part of your repertoire. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, and also verse 9 then. Here's verse 5. Having predestined us to adoption as his sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. According to the, come on, read it with me. According to the good pleasure. <laughs> How does that practically work out? When you like somebody, when you see them, there's a smile that comes on your face, isn't there? You like somebody when you see them and when you even see the things that they do and you watch and, and you're like, I just, I'm delighted. There's a pleasure. I'm really working with this just slowly today because I feel the need for people to go deep in their hearts and to be reminded and renewed and restored in the truth that God really likes us. Verse 9, Ephesians 1 verse 9. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. Oh, hey, hey, according to the good pleasure of his will. If I start on that phrase, I may never get anywhere further this morning because there's so much right there in that phrase. According to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. Can I tell you, he decided how he was going to accept you and what he was going to think about you before you even came on the scene. Huh? Do you know that's how true love and acceptance and grace works? I already know how I'm going to treat people before I meet them. I don't go, I don't measure how they act according to, and then measure how I'm going to respond. I already know that I'm going to show kindness to people no matter what they're going to do in return to me or how they're going to act. I already purposed it in myself. Before I made man, this is what I wanted. This is how I wanted them to be. I wanted them to be children of God as accepted as my only begotten son. I don't want to see them any differently than him and if they make a mistake I'm sending my only son to the cross to deal with their mistakes so that it is an infallible relationship so he loves me and there's nothing I can do about it now don't get religious on me of course you can reject it or accept it. But if your basis for his love is on your performance, you'll never receive what he wants to give you. The confidence, the joy, the peace, the acceptance. Glory, hallelujah. Yeah, it's his good pleasure and he purposed it in himself which means he decided how he wanted it and he also performed it and fixed every problem that would come against that will in himself. Abraham, in the Old Testament, Abraham, uh, God came to Abraham and he wanted to cut a covenant with him. And you might know the story and you might not know it. But here's what happened. God wanted to make a covenant with that Abraham look, looking forward to Jesus and this covenant he's going to make. And he wants to make this covenant with Abraham. And it's an interesting thing. He says when he came to make the covenant, he put Abraham to sleep. 
telling us very clearly that God wants to have a covenant and interact with man, but he doesn't want us to have any part of it because we'll mess it up. Abraham, get out of here. Go to sleep and I'll fix this thing between you and me. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, while we were still dead in trespasses and sins, Christ died for us. While we were still messed up, hey, get out of the way. Go to sleep, and while you're asleep and dead, I'll fix this problem for you and fix this relationship according to the good pleasure of my own will. He decided how he wanted it, and in himself gave the cure and the relationship. So here we go again. Can you handle it one more time? So what kind of relationship do I have with God? This is a quiz. <laughs> you hear it here all the time. Ah, Miss Vicky listens. <laughs> all of you do. I'm just teasing. But she said it. What kind of relationship do I have? I have the exact same relationship the father had with his son. That's right. It just blows our minds, doesn't it? Doesn't that just like, doesn't that just like make every hair, every religious hair on your being just kind of stand up and, <laughs> huh? I mean, this is so contrary to what people are told. But I have to tell it because I've sworn to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. <laughs> I swear to tell the truth. <laughs> I have to tell the truth. I can't water it down or mince it or make it what somebody would like it to be. i got to tell you the truth. The relationship you have with God today is the same one the Father had with His eternal Son. He didn't wake up this morning and look at him and go, Whoa, I like you. Right hand of the Father sitting there. His, you've been my son forever. We love each other with a perfect love. If you want to know what that's like, study it in your devotional in John chapter 17. That'd be your devotions for the week along with all these scriptures. John 17, the love which God had for the Father, he has for us. The same love that we might all be one, it says. And so, and so he doesn't, he didn't wake, he didn't this morning wake up. God doesn't wake up. He never sleeps, right? The Bible says, but he didn't look at his son, his eternal son and go, I really like you. Amazing love we've had between us today. Look at those people down there. What are we going to do? Can't hardly tolerate them. Here they are trying to talk to us again. The same feelings, the same emotion, the same acceptance, the same oneness, the same relationship is the same relationship we have. If that's not true, then we should take the cross away. We should take it out of the Bible. We shouldn't believe in what's in Scripture. Because if that work didn't do what it said it did, then why do we talk about it? But it did. And it did it perfectly. And friend, today, he likes me. Somebody says, well, shouldn't we behave well? Shouldn't we act like a Christian? Um, you should find out that you are one first. Because once you are, it's hard not to be. Because <laughs> I can get you to act like something for a long time and you not really be. But if I can get you to be, then I don't have to worry about your acting. 
Because if you are a racehorse, you are going to run like one. If I can tell you who you are in Christ, then go ahead and act like who you are. But if I focus on what you're doing instead of who you are, I'm just going to frustrate you because you're going to depend on your doing instead of your being or who you are. Come on, let me tell you who you are in Christ. You won't have a problem acting like him when you find out that your security is already there. Pray, praise you, Lord. I want to I wanna give you three things here, three words you can study, and our time's almost up, so I can't embellish much on these, but number one, I got to tell you, um, um, there's a word Paul uses in the New Testament to describe what Christ has done for us in this relationship, and it's called adoption. Adoption. We've been given Romans chapter 8. Here you can put that verse up there. Uh, uh, here it is. Look at this. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. I don't know why I use so many scriptures. I could camp on one of those like that and just preach for three hours. <laughs> we did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The relationship that we cry out toward God with is the one that comes from a spirit of adoption. Now, when the scripture, and this is all throughout the New Testament, Paul especially uses the term adoption to describe this thing. And the reason he uses it is because in the, in the original language which we look at in the Bible, um, this word adoption, it's a little different than what we use today. It, it includes those legal terms and being taken into a family and all of that. But the true meaning and the Greek of this is that you were placed as a son. So that's really the emphasis that he's making. So here's what he's saying when he says, look, we have this relationship with God. And our hearts cry out with this relationship. Because... Of this spirit of adoption. And this spirit of adoption means you were placed by God as a son into his family. So what's he saying in that one word? In that one word he's saying, you're not a son because of your behavior. You're a son because God put you in the family. Let us make man in our own image. In the image of God, he created us. Man messed with that, messed up that image with sin, and Jesus fixed it. So that we are not responsible or the ones who have done something to become children of God. He took us and placed us in that place. Glory, hallelujah. God gave me this place. Oh, praise you, Lord. Come on, let's close our eyes just for a moment. Lift our hands up toward heaven and just give him honor and praise. Oh, we worship you and praise you. God, here we are. Children of yours. Placed by yourself in this amazing relationship. Loved. Adopted. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. We give you praise. We worship you and honor you this morning. In Jesus' name. Oh, let the benefits of sonship come into every person's life, even as we speak now. Hallelujah. Let healing flow in people's bodies. Let peace come to their minds. Let, let answers come to questions. Let wisdom come to every person. 
that needs it. Let God your grace flow like a river because it is truly a gift of God. Let us walk in the fullness of your spirit. Walk in the light and the glory of your countenance. We are transformed into the very same image. And God, in case someone here is, is struggling with their own identity, with their own, um, people might say, self-worth or, or their own security, God, let them look into the perfect mirror. Let them look into the mirror of your word and find there that they find the face of Christ. There, hallelujah, they will find out that they are beloved, they are accepted, they are adopted, they are qualified, they are blessed coming in and blessed going out, they are healed, they are strong, they are favored, they are, they are blessed in everything they put their hand to. Thank you, God, we're the head and not the tail. We are above only and not beneath. We are blessed, hallelujah, blessed in the Lord, strong in His might, great in His grace, flowing in His grace and mercy. We give you praise today for such a perfect work. You delight in us and we delight in you. The root word for grace, you can Look up, put your hands down, whatever you want, whatever you want. The root word for grace, one of the root words for grace means that God smiles at us and then we smile back at him. It, it comes from the word we get our word joy from and it literally is like God pours favor toward us. He smiles at you when he looks at you and then you smile back at him and that causes him to have a bigger smile and then you smile back bigger at him and then he smiles bigger back at you and then you smile bigger back at him and you, off of each other's faces the smile just gets bigger and bigger. That's how our relationship with God ought to be. He he favors us and I favor him back. He favors me and I favor him back. Oh, I'm so glad I'm liked by God. I'm so glad he's smiling at me today through the blood and work of Jesus Christ. I am seen as his beloved son. Three words you want to study and look up. Number one, adoption. You are placed there. Oh, there's so much to that word. The second word is accepted. Accepted. You are accepted. Let me give you like a scripture for that. Ephesians 1 verse 6. He made us accepted in the beloved. Ephesians 1 verse 6. He made us accepted in the beloved. You notice that it doesn't talk about your performance, but that in the beloved, you're accepted. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Accepted means to be given special honor, highly favored, and to be accepted into the family. Huh? Huh? And the better part, the better, best part of the definition is, is that you're regarded favorably or with approval. We have been given such a religious consciousness that people are more in tune with God's disfavor than they are his favor. Uh, hey, can you handle three more minutes? Hey, listen. It's a terrible relationship. Okay, let, let's, put, let's step out of that kind of theological world over to a practical world. Again, this will help you. Your marriage is your relationships, all relationships. It's a terrible relationship that walks in fear. You do the right stuff in your relationship because of fear. You just look straight ahead and nobody will know that you've ever been there. 
We've all been there because we have human nature. But it is a terrible relationship. Uh, I, I want to, I, I, I do this because I don't want her or him to, I mean, let's, I mean, we're dodging the, that's a terrible relationship. What, what a, what a horrible existence. It's so wonderful to be in relationships with people where you just do what you do because there's acceptance. And out of that acceptance comes strength. Let's go to church because we don't want God to be mad at us. Let's do good things in our life so that we can hopefully get to heaven because we were good enough. Oh, that gets old. Consequence, the Lord told me years ago, consequence and, and uh, uh, oh, what was the other word? Uh, the consequence of things are not strong enough to modify behavior. I mean, have you ever, you know, and I apologize for using this up front, but it's one of the best illustrations I know. Uh, You know, uh, as a family, we went to see uh, one of the exhibits of, of human bodies. Anybody remember any of those when they were in town and they go around the country and stuff? And, and you know, they show the lungs of a smoker. Then you see the lungs of a smoker, and people see these things, and, and, uh, and we know all this stuff, you know, chances of, li- I mean, if, you're, if a person is a smoker, chances of living are like 15 years below uh, if you're not, and we've seen the lungs of a body with that's been a smoker and all that, and hey, by the way, if you're a smoker or were a smoker, let's believe God to heal you, huh? to make brand new lungs in you. So no condemnation here. I'm just using it as an illustration. God will heal you no matter what you've been through. That's the beauty of redemption. But hey, if you just looked at the consequences, who in the world in their right mind would smoke? Huh? I mean, if you just looked at the con- consequences are not enough. They're not powerful enough to change our behavior. Right? I mean, charcoal lungs. I mean, we saw them right there in the, the human bodies where, that were preserved. And uh, I just, uh, you just go, wow, that's unbelievable. And, uh, and, so, and so consequences are not enough. That's one illustration. You could use thousands of others. Uh, sugar, you know. I mean, what kind of a diet of sugar are we on in America? And we know that sugar is like the number one killer. Consequences just aren't enough to modify behavior. What is powerful, more powerful than consequences, is a healthy esteem for who we are. I can't eat sugar like crazy and smoke and destroy my lungs because I'm a child of the Most High God. I'm not afraid of what will happen. I don't care about that. I am who I am, and I'm going to live like who I am. There's a lot more power in that than in the consequences. And so, and so this security, this acceptance, and the third word is qualified. Everything, and you can look it up in the concordance, there's tons of scriptures. I'm adopted, I'm accepted, and I'm qualified. <laughs> That means all the conditions are met, folks. If you qualify for something, the conditions are met. This all happened through his pleasure and his goodwill. He placed me in this place. It accepts me. I'm secure in who I am. And it qualifies me for it all. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Oh, every head bowed and every eye closed. While the worship team comes to lead us in worship. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I have this opportunity for every person. Number one, will you put all your faith and trust in him? for your life and eternity. Exactly what I've talked about today, 
No trust in myself, no dependence on me, no worry about my mistakes or my well-doing. It's not measured there, it's measured, can I trust him for what he has done for me? And of course, every person can. So this morning, I want to give you that opportunity to say, yes, I trust Jesus Christ with all my life and all my eternity. Thank you, Lord. If that's you, would you slip your hand up? Say, yeah, that's me. I'm putting all my faith and all my trust in him today. Wherever your hands are all across here, we just give you praise and honor. You can put them down. Just wanted you to indicate to God today that all your faith and all your trust is in Jesus Christ. Just think about it. You're adopted, you're accepted, and you are beloved. You're qualified. Second thing, if you'd like to be filled with the Holy Spirit today, you've heard about it, you're hungry for it, or the Lord is just stirring your heart this morning, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the third thing, Maybe you have a need in your life. Maybe a church you went to called it a prayer request. That means something's going on with you, your family, friends, something you're concerned about. And by indicating in a moment, you're saying, God, I trust him for the answer. I trust him for the miracle. I trust him for the healing. I trust him for the answer. I give you all the praise. In Jesus' name. On any of these invitations, we already did the first one, but the, sec the, the, the second one and the third one, to be filled with the Holy Spirit or, bring, or to bring a prayer request to God and say, I trust you for the answer. Would you slip your hand up and say, yeah, that's me. On any of those two, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit or I'm bringing a prayer request to God for an answer, for a healing, whatever it might be. You indicated it to him. He saw you. And while we worship today, would you just say to him, Scripture talks about asking. And I want you to ask from that place of being qualified, accepted, and adopted. Now listen to me carefully. Do you think God would hear Jesus prayer the answer is yes and he hears you just like he does him because you've been placed in that place of sonship you are accepted and you are qualified don't think you can pray better tomorrow than you can today don't think you have to get your life straightened out before he'll hear you Maybe you need to straighten something out. Ask him to help you. That's what he wants to do. He loves you and he cares. He'll hear you just as much as he would hear Jesus. While we worship him today, thank him for your salvation. I want you to say to God in this worship time, I trust you. I put all my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Sometime in this worship time, I want every person to say, fill me with the Holy Spirit today. And somewhere in this worship time, I want you to take every prayer request, every concern, everything that you'd bring to God and tell him, I trust you for the answer, the healing, the miracle, the favor, the restoration the answer to this prayer request in Jesus' name. Come on, let's stand up and let's worship him together. Let's take this time to worship. This is where God does amazing things in your heart and life. In Jesus' name.